seems like making these banks less vertical yeah, that's part of and, and, and shallower and then stabilizing with micro inoculated bark mulch, you know, and then wider and less steep is going to slow everything down and have less scouring. And then as we get to an area in the wetlands before the pond, we expand it all out using soft engineering. So we put a distribution header, you know, sort of on a level area that we may have to do some excavation, but it seems like there's some plants in here that we could do better with some native wetland plants. And so we replant it specifically as a surface flow wetland and then a collection header before it goes into the pond to see if we can't collect, treat, and the water running off from the cornfields that are conventionally farmed. And so the idea is to test and create a water in the pond that'll be healthy to grow fish for human consumption. So what's coming in here now too, that's the road. So the water's coming off the cornfields and the driveways and the development, which is up on the ridge over there, flowing down that road to the point where you see the cars driving through it, big waves are flashing <laughs> up, you know, and then it's rushing down our driveway and dropping into the creek. There's a little creek that runs along that side of the edge there and then pouring into here. You know, and as the pond is transitioning into to safer water, because you probably have some legacy pollutants in there, but Folks at Floating Islands, because they're downstream from, in, in Montana, they're downstream from some pretty nasty agricultural practices. They're growing um, minnows. They have a minnow pond, and they take the minnows out and they sun dry them, and they, not that it's any disregard to the dirt, their dogs, but they love their dogs, but they use it for dog food, just, and they only feed their dogs dried fish that are grown in their pond that are converting the nutrient runoffs in the pond from, to algae on the surface areas, to fish flesh, to dog food. So, I mean, that's a strategy that can be employed until where we test the water for glycophosphate and all the other things that might be coming at us to, to work comfortable growing food for ourselves. And so when we think about the design of this, you know, flow forms coming down and, and then also the flow forms and this bank, I mean, as much as we can, the flow forms of this bank was made out of flow farm with the clays. And I don't know if the clays would work with the, with the myce mycelia, would, would stabilize it and everything like that. And so you could have all that benefit. And then you go into a wetland with a soft engineered surface flow, natural soft engineered wetland before it goes in. And I think that that, that combination would bring the water alive. And another thing that I saw about mycelia, and this is Paul Stamets again, is I took a bunch of my employees when I was still at Todd Ecological, and we did a pilgrimage out to see Paul, and we, we did a couple couple days there, and then we were driving off into the Olympic Peninsula, and he said, well, you check this, these, mic these bunker bags I have out there. And what he was doing is he was putting bunker bags across a stream, right? And uh, we just inoculated with oyster mushrooms. And we got to one and you could see these little bays weren't able to grow oysters anymore because they were so impaired by the septic fields on them. And so you'd see this kind of shitty water, literally, flowing out. And then it would hit the oyster mushrooms that were just bunker bags, you know, just like sandbags, but they're filled with wood chips and oyster mushrooms and you'd see the oyster mushrooms growing on them we even see them casting their spawn on it but you'd see them go you'd see the water improve across the first one there were three under a bridge and the water went from dead and wretched to beautiful and alive and vital after the third one there's no scientific way of putting that it's kind of a scientific liability but you talk about the unquantifiable that's just one of those things that well i've seen it yeah. I, I call that working with nature the way nature works it's just replication so we don't have to make it. I mean, Do you want to come around and just talk about how you'd want to flow form this down and to work with, you know, naturalizing the tree, you know, for with, with an engineer and as an artist and, you know, with the, how you'd like to sort of see that happen because I see as a, as a practitioner that all of this would be beneficial and how, how would you want to look at that one? Well, thank you for that invitation. I would definitely want to re d defer to the engineer, but um, in terms of the flow forms, I'm not the expert at designing the flow forms, but I know, you know, the Schaugerberger designs. And I've been wanting to incorporate flow form into a design forever, so. So many people with the work that I was doing has been saying, why don't you, why don't you? And so it was just a natural moment to pull, because years ago, Richard, my husband had a, a, we have books on all of Schauberger's work and the flow forms, and um, I'm working with other people who can create them, but I think we would want to make a custom design. I wouldn't want to imagine mm -hmm. exactly what that would be off the cuff, because that would be over-promising. 
and mm -hmm. I'd rather un under promise and over -promise. But we, I think we all see the potential and if it was stabilized enough in a storm, you know, in a flood storm event, it could just all go under and you just plan for, because we have climate change happening, so we have to plan for everything to go under or wash away or however be renewable, but just... Uh, working with the, the natural flow here and then, you know, talking to the land and from an engineering and and um, a communication perspective of working with nature, where would be the optimal location for, like you make a little, make your islands for these little flow form things, but just making the flow forms, I met somebody um, recently at the Craftsman Show at um, Grove Park Inn from California, and they were doing flow forms, and we were talking about being able to use the ceramic, but using the bioenergetically infused ceramic creating the flow forms just because I think what we're up to is a layering process of how many layers can we work with nature the way nature works. Now we can uh, get to call it biochar, bioenergetically infused clay flow forms and then... Well, when you're working with glyphosate and when you're working with heavy metals and when you're also working with EMFs, you know, yep. because <laughs> we, we are invaded by so many chaotic disruptors. And it's not just the water, but we know that this water is being also impacted by the electromagnetics and the geopathic stress. And so if we introduce um, maintaining water vitality from an electromagnetic perspective, but like in a really, the way you said it, somebody said it, put the, the complexity of the technology embedded in the application and the simplicity yeah in the use, yeah. so it doesn't have to be complicated. Interestingly, Richard, I used to be somewhat skeptical, if not cynical, about things like EMFs and, and all of these things that interrupt, and then having Lyme disease like Richard has, it just totally sensitized me to all of them. Now I'm healthy again, I'm much less sensitized, but having that period of my life where I was super sensitive, couldn't go near a microwave oven, all of those things, I completely understand it now, and I went from very skeptical and cynical to, yeah, there's something there that has to be acknowledged and, and dealt with. So. And also, we have a wonderful spring, and John Nilsson, who some of you know, is pretty inspired by water. He turned me on to Victor Schomburg and said, you got to look at this stuff, Pat, you know, I just like was totally into it. He got somebody who had all kinds of different meters to measure the water. I didn't get any of the details, so I'm not going to be able to do justice to this. But he came out, and they are measuring the spring, because we all love the spring. It just tastes wonderful. It's so much better water, and it's just so cold. And we're, you know, so John said they came in the first measurement, he said, oh, really good. The next one, he said, I'm not good at all. I'm right. surprised. This is really bad. And then he was walking around the property, and we didn't stop the smart meters when they came in. I just got permission to get them taken out, though. That's going to be an interesting journey. But um, basically, on the battery building over there, there's an array of smart meters. And he looked at all these and said, what are these? Wait a minute. And he looked at put his meter on, and they went back to this pond. The spring was pulsing with the smart meters. Thank you. That's my point exactly. And that's why when we're working with water, because water is a conductor of electricity, we need to take a look at the visible and invisible um, disruptors that's not just chemical. And somebody here was with Zach Bush at a soil conference or whatever, and Zach is a colleague that I've worked with also. And now just with the gut biome and the soil biome and the quality of the water, we need to be sure that we're looking at that full spectrum balance of frequencies that is just beyond the matter. You know, it's the quality of the energy. I mean, where the wash is coming off the road, where you don't have a continuous flow, but where you have intermittent flows, that's not the flow. You know, the, the road ditches are opportunities for the gabions. They're opportunities just to plant native species that'll uptake and create, you know, a healthier habitat. The water can benefit by flowing through and just instead of letting it fill with, full of invasives and uh, and weeds and so they can they can be managed to help with this whole process. I mean And those solar panels there are an opportunity too to add coherence to the field because while they are low carbon, they're still torquing the field in a similar manner as the smart meters. Mm -hmm. Even though they're energy efficient, they're not coherent. But you can take something that's non beneficial in one area and you can transform it to become positive at a whole nother level besides energy efficiency. And it reacts with the water, and if you look at them in proximity to the water and to the school, it's a golden opportunity to raise quality.
so because the solar panels are, are, are an interesting and good resource because if we decide with this pond that we want to really optimize its treatment then maybe we want to get aeration in there and to get aeration in there maybe we're going to want some some electricity um, to, to do that. And well, so, indeed, at the other end of the pond, there's another whole array of them. So in, in, in this stretch right here, were you thinking um, of some elevation controls to maybe have drop structures or something so it's not so steep? I can't, I, I, that would be interesting to integrate flow forms with those elevation controls with drop structures again so to to slow it down and to let it go and so that would be really interesting to so do if like there's some mini dams kind of yeah and, and, and in between the mini dams you have the flow form so the water's just going right like that because right the stretch right in here where it's dropping yeah. and you can see all the incising i see that right there which was worse than a couple years ago when I was yeah there. no I, I think that's a fantastic idea no i wasn't thinking of it but you did this whole thing was a pond one so that's all sediment pond sediment right probably wow so yeah. whenever we're whenever it's getting graded or, or carved up that's that's a resource right there pond sediment is probably going to be pretty good this whole bowl was a pond once a long time ago. Yeah. This here was wetland and they built it up, you know? And now I see it as putting it in. They're going back to wetland, yeah. Or, or going back to wetland for treating this pond for all the cornfield runoff. Which is, you know, that's a, that's a big thing of what I think we're, that I didn't know before today that, I, that we know now is that, that offsetting the runoff from the cornfield and some of the toxins from that is going to be a, a real goal. And it's a research opportunity, it's an innovation opportunity, and it's, it's a, you know, with the end goal of creating healthy food in the, in, in the pond. So but again, the mycelial community being part of this treatment, intercepting, mm -hmm. you know, the mycelial just community. put mycelium like in the roadside ditches. Or yeah, you could just, so you could just have a mushroom production farm right here and, and use, use bark mulch as your media and then just dump it in the ditches and you'd be doing something right there. If we had time, we could just tour the entire series of swales and berms that we made, which is why we have that pond at the other property. He was telling me about it. We can definitely work with that. You know, we can definitely, you know, move, change how the water moves, slow it down. He takes the water from all that land, which is where animals are and stuff, and it ends up first as it, at first when it, when it hits the burn, the swales, it just goes into the soil. And until there's so much that we run off, that's what we want to have happen. Then it goes backwards away from the pond. But it, do you really want to perk? water with nutrients in it into the soil or do you want to use that nutrients well we, our plan is to have all kinds of plants on either side of the yeah. swale yeah. capturing it you know yeah. we're already working on putting plants in capturing compost yeah yeah right and then once it's backed up it's just like a, i think it's like a half percent or one percent grade away from the pond so that all the stuff that would float in and clog up the system floats that way and settles back there then it starts flowing the other way and it goes down through what was originally a wet feature area, like a natural spring that had been a, it was architecturally interesting. People had already had like a little place there. They built all kinds of stonework and stuff. They tried to work with some of that, but it's basically a wetlandy design that also has tons of charcoal underneath it. Mm -hmm. So that all that stuff goes through the wetland, through the charcoal, then ends up in our pond. Nice, mm. nice. Yeah, he was telling me about that. And it sounds like he's that really, really good start in on there and then really he added project. also a wetland that takes the driveway stuff off that keeps that separate from everything else you know and that just flows back into the regular riparian stuff that happens the drainage just that goes to the river but the stuff from our driveway and from the char plant and all that first goes through a wetland oh so this here gray willows and stuff are moving in but it's something that could be excavated to create a, a surface flow wetland because it's mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. it doesn't have a lot of ecological yeah. significance and I wanted to ask Tom if like he thought a centrifugal sediment trap, you know, a conventional concrete thing would have a place here. And I think that it, it actually could in terms of sediment management, or do you think the volume of sediments is just too great for that? Well, it, it has its advantages. It's easy if you do it. Easy to manage, yeah. Yeah, easy to go in there with a loader to take stuff mm -hmm. out. So, yeah. that's, what, that's what my thinking was, because you were saying it's just how, so hard to keep up with the sediment. We don't want the pond to fill in, and this is a very great way. I mean, especially when we're downstream from some flow farms and, and so some of this really beautiful thing, but there's a kind of elegant conventional engineering potential to, to stick in a centrifugal or conventional sediment trap that could make our management of keeping this pond not fill in. That's, that's a big deal when you have something like this and you want to take care of the 
sediment mm -hmm. that comes in mm -hmm. to be able to get in there mm -hmm. easily. Well, we should look at that. That might very well become part of the plan. To me, the sediment's a resource, you know? Yeah, and so, so, but this, is, this, so this is the easiest, way of easiest, cheapest way of managing the resource. Mm -hmm. We're not devaluing it as a resource. We're saying, let's manage it easily instead of spreading it out, having to dredge, having to get a long arm backhoe out there to, you know, like I'm looking at that area right there. It looks like a tidal flat. We could grow clams in it if it was salty enough. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so before it gets to there, because we want to be growing fish there, we take it here, the sediment's a resource, as we said, we scoop it out once instead of, you know, so it'd be, make it an easier, more accessible resource. Mm -hmm. now, we're not going to have time to get into it today, but when nutrients gets in, that's okay. We're going to make this pond so it can convert those nutrients into algae and then into fish flesh, quite simply. And then, and then you know, we can irrigate the gardens with this and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and turn the, the remaining nutrients from, you know, from the fish into, into really high-grade irrigation water, you know. Monsanto do it, and they call it vertigation, right? right. <laughs> I know that there's landscape architects here, there's engineers here, there's growers here, and so you guys have the resources we need, and Richard's got the experience with restorers and everything like that, so it, it could be a real opportunity for the school and the community. And we've got the solar panels there. I mean, I'm, you know, for this, upon this size, even heavily loaded with, with the right polyculture, two half horsepower blowers would do it, and that's only one of those panels, so. I have a question. Can you define what a gabion is? It's a wire box of rocks. Okay. Yeah, and so instead of rocks in there, I'm thinking that we would have biochar in there, we could have clay in there, and we could have rocks in there because we've got to get minerals back into the soil as well, so that could all be part of a beneficial mix. And then, of course, because you don't, you want to be able to retain it, then the size of the wire that you're retaining it with, the gabion would be much finer than your typical gabion. But sandbags, it would be a, that would be probably the first way. I mean, that's how Stamets was doing his bunker bags full of mushrooms. So why don't, yeah, we could do, you know, we could actually use probably burlap would be a great material because then you could compost that right into the soil. And when you're done with that, could it go into the compost? That's what I'm thinking, yeah, yeah. Right into the compost or directly applied to the soil. Maybe the compost to get a little microbial. Whew. It seems like there's a really good group in this community and we just have to learn as a group to, to integrate all these disciplines and teachings and schools into, into this one design.